Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose, the director here at Long Now. Tonight's Long Short uh, came to us. I think uh, the first person that sent it to me was uh, Austin in our office, but then several more people sent it after that. It's by Josh Owens and, um, and even Stuart, I think, even sent it. But it's a, it's a once again, it's a cop out to doing a, uh, a film about long term thinking in a short form in that it's a time lapse. And uh, in this case, it just seemed to feel so right because there's nothing like a time lapse of a city to make, you sh to make it really feel like the giant super organism. Thank you. All right, who's going to do the first 100-year time-lapse film? Yeah, good evening, Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. 
Jeffrey B. West uh, has been the president of the Santa Fe Institute for the last five years. And I uh, was on the board for 14 years, never missed a meeting. Um, because looking over the shoulder of the scientists working there was one of the most fun things you can imagine. The subject of the Santa Fe Institute is complex adaptive systems. And uh, just the level of discourse is so good there that the novelist Cormac McCarthy, they can't chase him out of the building as near as I can tell. In fact, they made him something official, right? Put him on the board or something. Um, just hangs out there for the quality of the conversation. But every now and then, they haul off and change science. Uh, a couple of years ago, Jeff West and James Brown, macroecologist, and some others, uh, explained a mystery in biology called Kleiber's Law, having to do with uh, scaling in organisms. As they get bigger, they get more efficient, but they get slower. And uh, not only explained the mechanisms of that, but even the mathematics of that. It's pretty good for a physicist. Whenever you guys mess around with physics, Biology changes, but physics doesn't, I notice. <laughs> um, not content uh, to stay with that Laurel. He went on to even stranger organisms. And in a sense, you can see it in this film. The weather blasting by uh, was clearly something full of originality and full of pattern, uh, complex and adaptive. The city life going on with the weather beating against it, clearly complex and adaptive, and also seems to have some structure. And that's what Jeff has been looking at. Jeffrey West. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out on a Monday night to listen to uh, <laughs> talks about cities and companies and uh, life getting faster and so on. And thank you to the Long Now Foundation for having me. So uh, this title, actually, I really owe to uh, Stuart and to Kevin a little bit because I had suggested a classic kind of mundane, boring, academic title. Uh, which uh, that doesn't have the same kind of provocation and speculation that's implied in this title. But this is, in fact, what I'm going to be talking about. And uh, it's really part of something that uh, is much bigger than answers to these questions, or at least the answers to these questions um, really are talking about, at some level, the whole question of sustainability and the question about whether all of this, meaning all of socioeconomic life, the kind of life that human beings have um, evolved over the last 10,000 years when we started forming communities, all of this is actually sustainable. And um, that's really an underlying theme of everything I'm going to be talking about tonight. And uh, implicit also in that is kind of an even bigger question in some ways because uh, to answer that question, we have to ask, are there laws of life that can be quantified and put into a predictive framework so we can answer questions like the one at the top and the, one implied, the ones implied in the title. And um, the whole question of sustainability of socioeconomic life, you know, having cars and lights and uh, being able to ha make clothes, and uh, to have cities and so on and so forth, is really bound up with cities because cities have been and still are the crucible of civilization. Um, they are the place where we've come together and they, are, they represent what is really the greatest impact that human beings have had on this planet, uh, embodied in our cities and what has been happening in the last 200 years. In the last 200 years, uh, we have, at an exponential rate, created urbanization, and urbanization has, in many ways, created the tsunami of problems that we feel we have to face in the uh, beginning of the 21st century. Everything from global warming to questions of the environment to questions of health, pollution, disease, financial markets, risk, economies, etc., etc. All of these problems, in quotes, are generated by cities because that's where everybody lives. 
just to give you some numbers, when the country was formed, when our country was formed 200 years ago, less than a few percent lived in cities. Now, more than 82% live in cities. Uh, two or three years ago, the world crossed the halfway mark. More than half of us now are urbanized. China is building uh, maybe 300 new cities in the next 20 to 25 years. And what I put on the slide here, this remarkable fact that if you average over the next 40 to 50 years, every week, every week, a million people are being urbanized on the planet. And this is going to have a profound effect on all of us, no matter where we live, um, as we start to get the pressure of resources and energy and so on to accommodate all of this. So this is a huge problem. So urbanization in cities are an extraordinary phenomenon which has led us to these uh, big problems that we have to deal with. But also, as I put up there, urbanization is the solution because the other remarkable and fantastic fact about cities is they act as vacuum cleaners, as magnets, as hubs that bring in creative people. That's where ideas are made, that's where wealth is created, uh, and that's where the solutions to these problems, if there are any, are to be had because cities attract creative people. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that a good percentage of you here that live in San Francisco were not born in San Francisco. I mean, there's, there's this extraordinary migration to cities and you're attracted. In fact, that film expresses it to that buzz, that extraordinary buzz that is the essence of cities. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. So, um, before I go into it, I just want to mention uh, Stuart already mentioned Jim Brown, my uh, collaborators in this. These are the people, most of these people have done all the work. As I like to think of it, I'm the great bullshitter that comes out <laughs> and tries to integrate some of the ideas. But I've distinguished here the top three because I'm going to be talking for the first part of this talk about biology and organisms. And uh, the work that Stuart referred to was done with uh, at least the top two gentlemen. Uh, Jim Brown is a very distinguished ecologist, very famous ecologist. Brian is, was a student and postdoc, and he is now himself a distinguished biologist, Van Savage, likewise. The blue people um, are ones that have been involved primarily with the city work, and in particular, I'd like to mention Luis Bethencourt, who has been a major collaborator of mine the last couple of years in this. Okay, so... Um, the... 10 billion people that are going to inhabit this planet in 2050 in some form or another want to live in places like this. The majority of them want to be in places like this, getting things like this, and participating in places and phenomena like this, culture, good restaurants, and so on, having iPads and iPod, iPods and all the rest of that stuff living in economies that are continually increasing and everything's getting better and the world is going to be wonderful, but they're not physicists. And if you're a physicist, you know that if you create all that, you also have to create entropy. And entropy is disorder, which means essentially that you have to have phenomena like this, 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 this. And the real question is, is that what San Francisco is going to look like in 2050? Is that what New York is going to look like, London? Or is it going to look like this? This is our challenge. Okay. So I would say that um, in order to address these problems, we desperately need a serious science of cities to complement our present more quali qualitative thinking. And by science of cities, I really mean what I mentioned before, a much more quantitative, hopefully mathematizable, predictive kind of theoretical conceptual framework where we can come to address these questions in a credible fashion. And this is very much meant to be to complement traditional methods. And so it's just to repeat again what I said earlier, are there universal 
quantifiable principles that underlie the fabric of our lives. Okay. So the two questions I posed myself in addressing this work are these two. Um, are citizen companies just very large organisms? They're just part of biology. We all grew out of biology. All of this stuff came from biology. And uh, the question is, is San Francisco an elephant? New York a great big whale? Is Microsoft a beehive? Um, and if they are, in what way are they? We often use, you know, in the literature, people use biological metaphors all the time. You talk about the ecology of the marketplace, the DNA of the company, the metabolism of the city. And so are those just qualitative kind of metaphors or is there serious substance to it? And if so, the question that is implied in the title to this talk, how come then that cities don't seem to die? It's extraordinarily difficult to kill a city. We know classic cases, but of the millions of communities <coughs> pardon me, that have um, grown on this planet, almost all of them are still with us. We've dropped atom bombs on cities, and 30 years later, they're thriving. So it's very hard to kill a city, very easy to kill a company. Of the millions of companies that are continually coming through, and I will show you data at the very end, almost all of them die, and the kind of mean lifetime of all companies is about 10 years. There are very, very few companies that are more than one to 200 years old, and most of those are in very special niches like breweries and wineries and so on. And the question is, can we develop a serious theory so that we can determine, predict, that's the provocative question, when Google and Microsoft are gonna go bust? This is the kind of question, or is that impossible, and so on. So we'll, that's gonna be towards the end of the talk. So here are just some of the characteristics of life, but they're also characteristics of social organisms, and I'm not gonna read them, you can, read, you, you can see them for yourself, but all of them, um, of course, you're familiar with, but all of them have their metaphors and analogs in social organizations. And this is what I've already said, I just wanna repeat it again. As a physicist coming to this, it is the question, are there any universal kind of laws, regularities that can lead to a predictive kind of theory? So it's, this, is, this is something actually was sent to me by my daughter recently, which I've adapted to this. So you, know, you wanna ask, are there laws governing this kind of cartoon? And as was, so this is the question <laughs> is, this is what I want to do. And I claim this is what we should be doing in order to really understand what the hell is going on. <laughs> okay. So take a good look. I'll leave it there for a second so you get it. Okay, so put slightly differently, is that just another version of this? Now this, which you're very familiar with, just a forest, looks like some random collection of trees and leaves and little plants and so on, but it isn't. It actually has extraordinary regularity and structure. And you can see that by asking a whole bunch of questions like, how many trees are there of a given size? Um, how far do you have to walk from a tree of a given size to another tree of roughly the same size? How many branches of a given size does each one of those trees have? How many leaves does it have? How much energy is flowing through each branch? How big is each canopy, et cetera, et cetera. Any question you can think of in a general way about that forest, you can answer and put in a ma with a mathematical formula and predict everything about the generic structure of that forest, not only that forest, but any forest across the globe. And so there's a theoretical framework, which I will talk about briefly, shortly, that can describe and predict everything on the average, what we call coarse-grained, about that forest and any forest on the planet. And one of the reasons for this is something that's truly remarkable about life and is crucial for its resilience and robustness, and that is the phenomenon of scalability, meaning that the same phenomena can be manifested over extraordinary scales as 
as is uh, given, shown in this slide, this is just us, this is us, mammals, going over a range of 100 million in size from the tiny shrew that sits on the palm of my hand to the whale, the blue whale, which is bigger than this building. And just to remind you, because everybody forgets this, first of all, everybody forgets that this is the biggest animal that has ever existed on this planet. Secondly, that up there, that little box up there, is the shrew on the scale of the size of the elephant. That doesn't surprise you. But what does surprise most people is that this is an elephant on the scale of a whale. So you can see a whale is, I would like to use four-letter words, but is very, very, very big. <laughs> and the extraordinary thing about this is that these are scaled versions of one another, even though they look different. And I'm going to emphasize that in a moment. But they look very different, but the same physics and chemistry, the same organization, the same uh, functionality exists through all of these. And uh, it works over this extraordinary range, but you can take it further because life itself actually scales in a systematic way from the thing in the top left-hand corner, which is a little engine, it's a little engine, that's a cartoon of the molecules that produce something called ATP, which is your currency of energy. That's what's keeping all of us alive here, is that little engine. And there are up to a thousand of those little engines inside the next little box, which is called a mitochondrion. And there's up to a thousand of those mitochondria inside each one of each cell. And there's a cell in the top right-hand corner and all of those have to work in some extraordinary coherent fashion. All of those little engines have to work together so that mitochondrion can work together properly. And all those mitochondria have to work together so the cell can function. And then you take 10 to the 14th of those cells and you put them together and they make things like this and this. And all of those have to work in this extraordinary integrated coherent fashion so that I can be up here waving my hands and passionately telling you how extraordinary all this is because it doesn't stop there. It makes all this stuff, including this. So something extraordinary is happening. That thing up in the left-hand corner is they're making this. That's what we're doing. We're just scaled versions making this. So how in the hell can all that work over several billion years if there aren't regularities and laws that have emerged by natural selection that are somehow constraining these so that it doesn't all fall apart in 10 minutes. It doesn't. It lasts for billions of years, except for this piece, which we don't know. This has only lasted, in some cases, for a few hundred. Maybe we can talk of thousands of years, and that's what we're going to be discussing. Now, we talked about scalability, but each one of us in this room has scaled. That's called growth. You've scaled up. And um, that's how you scaled. Except this happens to be a rat, but it could have been you. And what it is is <laughs> weight versus age for little rats. And there it is. It's what you recognize. You grow quickly, and then you stop. It's very important that we stop because that's also part of our own resilience when we stop growing. And the same theory with the same principles that gave the description of that forest, believe it or not, when applied to the growth of a rat, gives that line. That's the prediction. And those points are data. So it's the same theory. So we have kind of this generic universal theory can describe many things in biology, and the thing that is interesting is, the, the, thing, the question is, can we take that kind, these kinds of ideas, which I will elaborate on in a minute, and apply them to companies and economies? Now, let's go back to this. This is great for us, and it has been very, very important, this kind of what we call sigmoidal growth, stop growing, very important for our resilience and the resilience of all of biology, all of life. However, this is very, very, very bad if you're an economy or a city or a company. It's considered very bad because you stopped growing. 
very bad. What we want to see is this. This here is, uh, this is revenues versus age for a bunch of software companies, and you see they don't look like this. They look like this. They're hockey sticks, or J's, right? They're all going up, and everybody in that, those companies are making millions and billions of dollars, and they all live south of here and, <laughs> you know, or around here, I don't know. And they all look like this, growth. Very, very, this is crucial. This is the paradigm under which we live and the paradigm that has led all of you to be able to come here in your cars and to go back to nice, nice comfortable homes. But it's different than this. That's the message. Okay. Oops. And, sorry. And there's the economy. That drives it. That also continues. However, there's a dark side to our growth, which is this, and there's a dark side to the growth of companies, which is this. As I said, all companies end up like this, like we do. And that's actually, just parenthetically, extremely important. Very, very good that companies die, and it's very, very good that we die so that we can evolve, that new things come, new ideas happen for us over hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, we evolve. This is much shorter time scale, but it's very important so that new things can evolve into the economy. Well, let me get into this a little bit more um, quantitatively, a little more of the science. And here's a remarkable graph that was actually referred to in Stuart's introduction. This is called Kleiber's Law, and it is what it is is plotted on the vertical axis is something is metabolic rate, so that's how much energy you need per second to stay alive. It's your, um, it's your 2,000 food calories a day, okay? That's, what, that's plotted there. And it's plotted versus the weight, the mass of a bunch of organisms, and there it is. And it's plotted in this kind of curious way in order to get everybody on this plot you notice it's not linear, it goes up by factors of 10. 1, 10, 100 watts, and here, 1, 10, 100, 1,000 kilograms, so you can get everybody on the, on the same plot. And what you see is something truly remarkable, namely, despite the fact that all these organisms represent maybe the most diverse and complex phenomenon in the universe, nevertheless, they've all lined up on this very simple line, plotted this way. So uh, out of this complexity, this extraordinary complexity, or underlying this extraordinary complexity, is some extraordinary simplicity. And this is remarkable because we believe that each one of these organisms evolved with it in its own unique environmental niche, with its own unique evolutionary history. So each, uh, each one of these organisms, including us, is historically contingent, depending on all kinds of phenomenon during evolutionary, its evolutionary um, uh, history. And so you would have expected, when you plot something like this, these things to be all over the place, representing the individuality and the individual history, geography, environment, etc., of each one of these, not only each one of these organisms, but each subsystem, each organ, each cell type, etc. Each one has its own evolutionary history, and yet, magically, they've all lined up in some very, in a, some very, very simple way. And uh, this is called, incidentally, sublinear scaling, because the other interesting thing about this graph is that the slope of this, just the gradient of this, is three quarters. So it only goes up in the way we plotted here. It only goes up three times for four times moving along here. Now, that three quarters is less than one. That's why we call it sublinear. And that has an interesting consequence because if it were linear, if it had been linear, what does that mean? That means if you double the size of an organism, you would double the amount of energy it would need. And that's what you would have expected because you've doubled the number of cells. So you would have expected double the amount of energy to support it. What this says is you don't need double. That three quarters actually can be translated into saying if you double the size, you don't need double, you only need 75% more. 
So that says that the bigger you are, the more efficient you are. You have this, what is called, economy of scale. So, and indeed, I just showed another, and this is a very old data, showing that this is true across all of life, this same phenomenon, even down to cells. This is the same graph. I'm not going to belabor this. This is the same line going all the way down to cells, in fact, cells and mitochondria. So there's an extraordinary universality to this, and, um, and I've written it down here, that this extraordinary economy of scale, uh, the bigger you are, the less energy you need per capita. And I'm going to flip back for one second to this graph to point out something that I think is very important, and that is the overall scale of this. Look at you, man and woman, and go across and see how much, how much energy you need per second to stay alive. It's that bloody light bulb shining at me. 100 watts is all you need. So each one of you here, kind of spaced out, sitting there, is only using 100 watts. So we are extraordinary. Not only do you have a great economy of scale as you get bigger, but the overall scale is extraordinarily small. All you need is 100 watts to stay alive. 2,000 food calories a day, which may sound like a lot, is only 100 watts. And I'm going to show you at the end, and I'm going to repeat this, if you ask a different question, how much energy do you really need a day to stay alive, meaning all your cars and electricity and so on, your social metabolic rate, so you evolved only needing 100 watts, so hunter-gatherers on this planet only need of order 100 watts still today. You need, I need 11,000 watts bigger than the, the blue whale. So each one of us in this room is like a big whale. And, there's, and we're, we're moving towards 10 billion people, all of whom want to be big whales. This is the problem. Okay. Now, this, this kind of scaling, as I've written in red there, permeates all of biology. Anything you can think of, any physiological variable, any life history event scales in a systematic, very simple way. And I'm just going to flash on a couple of them. That is heart rate decreasing systematically. This is lifespan. And I'm just going to have thrown this on because it turns out the decrease, the rate at which you decrease your heart rate is exactly the same as the way increase of lifespan for mammals. And if you multiply the two together, the increase and the decrease cancel. So if you multiply lifespan by heart rate, it doesn't change from a small shrew up to the blue whale. But lifespan times heart rate is the number of heartbeats in a lifetime. So there's this extraordinary, roughly approximate rule that even though little things have lived very fast. They're very much in the, far, in, the, in the fast lane. A shrew beats at about a heart rate of about 1,000 times a minute. A whale's heart rate is, you know, boom, and you wait a minute, and then it booms again. But they do it in such a way that they have the same number of heartbeats in the lifespan, about a billion and a half. So if you understood that number, you would understand why I can make the following prediction. Everybody in this room will be dead in a hundred years. And in fact, looking more carefully around. <laughs> okay. So there's the data. And here's the point. So here's these extraordinary rules that permeate biology. As I say, the most complex and diverse system in the universe. How come it expresses somehow this extraordinary simplicity? Well, here's the answer. It's because all of life is sustained by networks of one form or another. Ones you're very familiar with, like the cardiovascular system, respiratory, renal system, even your bones, your neural system. But there are networks inside cells, inside mitochondria. There are networks inside forests. I mean, a tree is obviously a network, but the trees themselves together form a network. And what we will come to when we talk about cities and companies, we, of course, form a network. But it is the mathematical, geometric, organizational properties 
of networks that can be put into a mathematical form that underlie all of those scaling laws. And if you develop the mathematics, one can understand all of those scaling laws and much more. And I just want to flash on just pictures of networks you're familiar with. Uh, that's a little thing that lives inside an elephant. And, um, oh, let me leave that. Let me leave it there because it's a beautiful network. And the point is that you can mathematize these and all these laws can be um, uh, derived. And furthermore, you can understand the dynamics of the network. So if you perversely wanted to know, you know, so to speak, the radius length, the pulse rate, the blood flow rate in the ninth branch of a hippopotamus's circulatory system, there's some mathematical formula that tells you what it is. And um, I don't know what the answer is for hippopotamuses, but I know it's right for cats, mice, rats, dogs, human beings, where it's been measured. So let's go back to growth again very briefly. So here's the theory of growth in, in you know, all the bells and whistles have been taken off, and this has to be mathematized. But it's very simple. You eat, you metabolize. The energy then goes distributed through the network to maintain cells that are already there, replaces ones that die, and it grows new cells. So you can put that into mathematics, and that's what gave rise to that beautiful sigmoidal curve for the rat, is just putting this into mathematics and solving it. And I'm going to miss this out, actually. I'm getting late because it can be applied to cancer. And I just want to summarize some facts about biology before moving into the main part of the talk. So just to repeat, these are things I've said. There are these extraordinary universal scaling laws. They have an economy of scale. You have sigmoidal growth. You stop growing. And see there, I didn't emphasize the pace of life systematically gets slower the bigger you are. Hearts beat, I showed you the heart rates, hearts beat slower systematically. You live longer, di blood diffuses across, uh, I'm sorry, oxygen diffuses across membranes slower the bigger you are. But everything in a systematic way obeying these very simple laws. And the claim is that this is because of the mathematics of networks. And the question is, is it true of cities? Well, cities are networks. There's a classic example. But let, let's just, let me just emphasize something that I said when I showed you the picture of the mammals. So even though the whale lives in the ocean, the giraffe has a long neck, and the elephant a trunk, and I'm standing on two feet, and the shrew can run around fast on my hand, and so on. Actually, um, those characteristics are, are this, for the purposes of this talk, are totally superficial because at the 85, 90% level, you tell me the size of a mammal, I can tell you everything about it, about its physiology and its life history to 90% accuracy. And, it, and the trunk and the living in the ocean are that other 10%. So we understand at a, at a very coarse-grained level, we understand much of the way these systems work because of the networks that sustain them. And the question is, can we do the same for cities and companies? Because they are networks. So maybe, even though New York and San Francisco and Santa Fe and Boise may look quite different, are, are, in fact, are they in fact scaled versions of one another? Is San Francisco just a scaled down New York? And is Santa Fe just a scaled down San Francisco? Even though we're in different geography, we have different history, we're made of adobe, you're made of whatever it is, bricks and so on. And so, and so the question is, are these in fact uh, scaled versions? Is there one city in the United States and all cities are just scaled versions of them according to some simple rules? Well, as I say, they are networks. There's one, there's another network that supplies it. But this is the most important network. This is, a, is really a symbol of the social network. We are part of a social network. We all interconnect with one another, and we cluster in very universal kinds of ways, beginning with families and jobs and so on, and I will elaborate on this in a minute. But this, in the end, is the most important network 
that dominates cities, not the infrastructure, and we will come to this. So here's the first data that we looked at, was asking the very question, are cities in fact scale versions of one another when we actually look at data? So here's some very mundane data. This happens to be, well, we were doing it in Europe. These are my, some European collaborators I had. Uh, gas stations as a function of size. So this is the same plot that I showed you in biology, except for gas stations, and size is, uh, we use the population, and here it is, it's that same going up by factors of 10, and what you see, it's pretty good scaling. You tell me the size of a city in Spain, I will tell you how many gas stations it has from this. And what you see is it scales in all these countries, and it scales in a similar way in each country. In fact, the slope of these, the gradient of these lines, are all pretty much the same, and they're less than linear. This, uh, I should have drawn it on the graph, other graph. This is the linear, which would mean double the size of a city, double the number of gas stations. No. There's an economy of scale. Not surprisingly, the bigger the city, you actually need less gas stations per capita in a systematic way across Europe. But you know something? It's the same graph in the United States, in China, in Japan, and so on. Not only that, it's the same for any infrastructure you look at, which I'm not going to show you the graphs. That is, you look at the total length of roads, you look at the length of electrical lines, you look at the water lines, anything you want to think of to do with infrastructure, you plot it, and it looks just like this anywhere in the world with the same slope, same gradient. So there's this extraordinary universality in infrastructure but much more important, and, and in fact, this is very much like biology, very much like biology, but this is much more important when we looked at phenomena that have no analog in biology. These are phenomena, characteristics, that did not exist in the planet, possibly even in the universe, unlikely, but certainly did not exist on this planet until we started talking to one another and forming communities eight to 10,000 years ago and then ultimately forming cities, things like wages and something that one of my friends, Richard Florida, calls super creative people, you lot, for example. And if you plot them in that same way, the same way as we did the biology, you know, there's quite a bit more scatter, but you see a definite scaling trend and uh, what you also see is that the slope of these lines is bigger than one now, not less than one, and we call this superlinear rather than sublinear. And what this means is, in English, that look at the top graph, systematically, the bigger the city, the higher the wages per capita, and the more fancy-schmancy, super, um, super creative people there are per capita. But you also notice that the slope of these lines is very similar, about 1.15. There's kind of this 15% value added the bigger the city. And we will explore that. This turns out to be true for any socioeconomic quantity. Socioeconomic meaning something that has no simple analog in biology, like wages and super creative. But it's true not just in the United States, it's exactly the same everywhere in the world. And it's the same for all the phenomena that happens to be patents produced in the United States, that happens to be crime in Japan, this is police, tax receipts, construction, debt, and here we put together one plot and what we did is we took, I forget what it is, GDP of the city, the number of patents produced, the uh, number, the crime, and the income, and you can see they all pretty much follow the same line, and they all have this rough the slope, roughly, of 1.15, this kind of 15% value added, and this is true, we could have, this is actually United States data, but it's the same in China, Japan, just to repeat myself, Chile, Colombia, across Europe, all the cities, that, all the countries where we've been able to get data. So there's this kind of extraordinary universality which is remarkable because cities in Japan evolved completely 
independently of cities in Europe or the United States. So somehow agglomerating people and forming communities, no matter what kind of political process went on or what kind of planning was inducted, no matter what kind of community action was done, on the average, on the average, there were these constraints at work that made a city kind of conform to the scaling. So that, if you tell me the size of a city in a given urban system, meaning, say, in the United States, I can tell you at the kind of 85% level how many police it will have, how many patents, how many AIDS cases, how many hospitals, what the length of roads are, et cetera, et cetera. So here's another way of saying it that if you double the size of a city, then you will systematically get a 15% increase in the number of patents, colleges, creative people, police, crime, AIDS, flu, pollution. But you'll also get a 15% savings in infrastructure. So it's kind of amazing. And it is no wonder that everybody comes to cities because we're very good at ignoring all you lot that came to San Francisco because of this buzz and all the wonderful things and the beauty and the, all the good jobs, hopefully, etc. culture. Uh, you forget about AIDS cases and crime and so on, which is also increased, and San Francisco conforms to this, actually. Okay. So, um, well, oh, this is a bit too busy, this slide. I apologize. But it has a nice quote. I apologize. I put it on because there's this wonderful quote from Goethe, uh, which is relevant, which you can read as I explain the following. Sorry about this. I'm going to go back. But in biology, we had a similar kind of thing to this, but it was always sublinear. Growth stopped, economies of scale, and the pace of life got slower the bigger you are. They're all a package, and all because of networks. If it is networks that are giving rise to this, if it is underlying network structure, the mathematics of the network, and it is superlinear, and it gives rise to superlinear behavior, then the pace of life, according to the theory, must increase systematically. Things get faster the bigger you are, and that's what this quote was because we know the face of life gets faster and we've checked data. I will flash onto this first to show you a whimsically some data. This is biology, this is heart rate, this is modern data, and it decreases. You can see that the slope there is very close to one quarter, which I mentioned earlier. But on the right, whimsically, we plotted walking speed versus size, and you can see that it systematically gets bigger gets faster, the faster, the bigger the city, the faster the walking speed. And that line is, roughly speaking, what we predicted. OK, the other thing that happens in cities as an unintended consequence, which is very good, is that the carbon footprint gets lower the bigger the city is. Because here's some data that we've plotted, and watch in the same way, exactly the same way, and what you see up in that corner there is a number which is less than 1, that 0.87, whatever it is, 0.879, roughly 0.9, is the slope of that is less than 1, which means the bigger the city, the less carbon is being deposited per person. So cities are fantastic because everything gets more and you save more. So it's been very, very good for us. It's been, that's no doubt why all the wonderful things that have happened in the last 200 years have been happening. There is an underlying dynamic um, which constrains things so that in the things that we're looking for get more, and that is associated with growth. And I've written down here just a summary of what I've been saying, that um, this superlinear behavior is a result and is feeds back onto wealth, wealth production, wealth creation uh, in a systematic way. And the pace of life systematically has to get faster. Um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about cities before talking about companies and finishing up is I'm going to talk about the um, growth and collapse. Because 
This is the cartoon of what happens in biology. Just to repeat, you have sublinear behavior giving rise to fast growth at the beginning and then stopping. That's a very stable situation, very resilient situation. And that is very bad for cities and economies. And it is a wonderful piece of the theory, I think, that if the theory gives rise to superlinear behavior because of the networks, then the same theory, the same equation, which takes incoming resources and, roughly speaking, maintains what's there and grows new things, that kind of framework gives rise to this rather than something that's sigmoidal and stop. It actually predicts something like this, which is very good, faster than exponential, which in fact is what's been happening. And so that's very good, except it has a horrible catch in it. It has a catch which is given by this line. It says, as you get bigger, somewhere you approach a line which we call, which is called a finite time singularity. That's just a mathematical phrase. But, but it's very important because you, as you approach it, you eventually collapse, and on the right-hand side, that's what happens to you. You stagnate, and then you collapse. So you want to avoid that. How have we avoided that? How have we avoided this? And indeed, this collapse is actually intimately related to the running out of resources, whatever it is that's driving the economy, at some point approaching this dotted line here, this so-called finite time singularity. Now, how have we got out of it? We got out of it because you have to remember that this kind of growth, which I've put, made a cartoon of here, was um, based on a given kind of paradigm that is determined by a major innovation that dominated the culture of whenever, whatever period we're looking at. So this could be the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You see have a coal, steam, and so on. This could be something that happened recently, namely the discovery of computers. Or it could be something even more recently, the transition to IT. And so here's what really happens, is that you start this huge growth. If you continue, you would collapse. You innovate, which means you start over again. You kind of set new, what we call initial conditions, and you start the system over again. So a major innovation, coal is discovered, boom, and off we go. But then we would reach a situation, a threatening situation, and we start again. So that's great. That's what we've done. So there's a kind of theorem you can derive that says if you want to have continuous growth and avoid collapse, you have to have continuous cycles of innovation. And this is true whether actually for the whole economy, and it's true for any social organization, that you have to have major breaks that occur driven by some major change in the, uh, in, in the socioeconomic culture, which we usually think of as a major innovation. That's great, except the theory says, yes, you have to do this, but it also says the time to go from here to here is necessarily longer than the time from here which is necessarily longer from time there in a systematic way, meaning that, that you have to not only innovate on a continuous way, but you have to innovate faster and faster and faster according to the rules governed by this expanding network. So the image is that not only are we on a treadmill that's going faster, but actually we have to change treadmills faster and faster. So the real question is, is that at all sustainable? Can we do that? Or is there some way out of this, uh, this kind of paradox that we've boxed ourselves into, namely that in order to have wealth creation, we need growth, and growth needs to then go in this kind of cyclic fashion, and we need to have major innovations that, to continue that growth. So I just, I'm not going to well on this to show you data, but um, I do want to take, I'm going to come back to that question in a second, but I want to first talk briefly about, I want to go back, I should have done this earlier, to one of these graphs. This graph, this is a good one. 
So there's Tokyo, and there's the scaling line. So this is what would be predicted if we had a complete theory of the social network. And this is the line that represents the average idealized behavior of a city anywhere in the world. This happens to be Japan. But you notice up at the top, the last dot, which happens to be Tokyo, is actually underperforming. It's a little bit lower, which means it has less crime rate than it should for a city of its size, whereas Osaka, the next one, has a little more crime than it should have for a city of its size. Therefore, zoom, 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 zoom. I should have had that in. We can distinguish the individuality of a city by how each city deviates from what it's the scaling line, which represents the idealized, you could even use the word possibly optimized um, uh, metric for its size. So that's what I've tried to say here. And so this gives a way of ranking cities according to whether they over or underperform. So we've done that for the top 363 cities of the United States. And there's a graph just for 2003 patents. And it's spelt wrongly, but the, the city that mostly overperformed, so I should explain this, make sure you understand it. The straight line across, if you sat on that line, you would sit exactly on the scaling curve for patents, meaning you have the right number of patents for your size. And you can see Phoenix has a little more, whereas Denver has a little less, and so on. All the way down, New York isn't very good, and the shittiest city in the world, the most... <laughs> In a non-innovative city in, 19, in 2003 was Abilene, Texas. <laughs> and the most innovative city was Corvallis, Oregon. And not surprisingly, San Jose is way up near the top. I forget where San Francisco is. I should have looked that up. But San Jose, because San Jose includes Silicon Valley. And I should have said, city here means metropolitan area. We don't use, obviously, political boundaries. San Francisco... When we say San Francisco, we mean the, uh, there's a well-defined or reasonably well-defined metropolitan area that urban geographers use to define uh, San Francisco as a metropolitan statistical area. So this is an interesting way of ranking them. And one of the most interesting things that came out of it, and this is the reason I want to talk about, I wanted to show you this, is what's plotted here is the time sequence of those deviations. So... That line, that black line, if you want that black line, you would be exactly on the scaling curve, and you would, if you stayed on that line, you would, from 1970 to 2005 and beyond, you would be exactly on the scaling curve. So each one of these points represents the trajectory of how you've deviated. And the thing that you get from this is that if you're a shitty city in 1960, you're a shitty city in 2010, <laughs> And if you're an exciting city in, 2000, in 1960, you're still an exciting, overperforming city in 2010. Meaning that it's very hard to change cities. Cities are extraordinarily re resilient and resistive to major change. So all of the stuff that you do has to take decades. So what we call persistence time is not politician's time of, you know, two years is infinity, it's decades, 40, 50 years, and there are very few metrics that you can change quickly. This happens to be patents, patent production. Um, we've done it for, all of, for most of the, uh, um, uh, the metrics, and we have a map for all the cities, and you could actually, there's a website somewhere that you can click and find out all about these cities and their rankings. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about companies in a minute. I want to just dwell a little bit, going back now to why it is that we have these extraordinary scaling laws. What is it? I've said networks, but what is it that is universal? How come that Japanese cities and cities in Chile and cities in the United States and in Portugal all scale in the same way, with the same slope. 
So what is it that is universal across the globe? Well, the universality of cities and this <laughs> are people. People are cities. This is the most important point, I think, to recognize, is that it is not all those beautiful buildings and the roadways and the slums and the rest. Actually, cities are a physical manifestation of our social interactions. The network that connects us and the network beginning with family, I will call it family, but you know, family here means how many people can you actually have a strong relation with, a really loving, I'll use the word love, that you can love. Well, universally, this number is somewhere between four and six. You can have 500 best friends on Facebook, but then that doesn't mean anything. What really means something is the people that you deeply care about, and that is the kind of core of social I sound like a rabid Republican in a way. But this, this is the crucial anchor of the whole network structure. It doesn't have to be family. It's just people that you're very strongly connected to. This is true, incidentally, even in families of 15, each individual actually only connects to about four or five very strongly. You don't connect to the, you don't, 15 of you are not best friends, actually. So, and that network then goes up because families then interact, jobs, and so on. So there's a whole hierarchy of clustering all the way up uh, the, uh, the, the hierarchy, the, the, the social organization. And it is that structure, and it is the structure of those networks that are being reflected in these scaling laws and why they are universal. Because that kind of structure is a kind of universal structure, the structure of human interaction, social interaction, and social clustering. Now, one of the clusterings that occurs is in companies. And so um, I want to now talk a little bit about companies and finish up. And the first question is, as we did with cities, we just discovered that kind of on the average, New York is a scaled up San Francisco and San Francisco is a scaled up uh, Santa Fe, for want of a better one. The question is, what about companies? Are companies scaled versions of one another, even though they seem to be com quite different? And um, I'm just going to show you a teeny bit of data because this work is very much work in progress. This is not published, but I want to show you this graph. This is, one of these is income. Uh, which one is it? The blue is income and the green is assets of companies and is plotted in the same way in this kind of going up by factors of 10, as you see. And we do the size of the company by employees. Could have used sales, doesn't matter actually. But there it is. And what you see is extraordinary scaling. I think the top one, the one which has you notice over a million, well, uh, several million employees, 10 to the 6 is a million. This is Walmart, I think. So amazingly, Walmart, I don't know what this company is, this company of only 100 employees is actually a scaled up company of 100 employees, according to its assets and so on. So we have done, we have taken, actually, uh, we've looked at uh, something like 22,000 companies, publicly traded companies in the United States, and uh, this is not, some of these are international, this, this graph. But we've looked at 22,000 companies and we've looked at all of their metrics, that are all their metrics meaning all of the things that 25 or various categories, they report to the Internal Revenue Service. And what we find is scaling, there's quite a lot of fluctuations actually, not seen in this graph, but scaling is incredibly important, but even as important is what I have emphasized before is the slope of that line. And the slope of this line, can you believe it, is less than one. That's what that number is, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. This one, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. It's less than one, meaning that it's sublinear in the language I used, and the bigger the company, the less assets per employee and the less income, total income of the company per employee. It's very much like us. Companies are very much like us. Cities had this super linear, very open, everything expanding. 
You saw that growth, everything getting bigger and expanding. Companies are not like that. So if that theory applies to this, you shouldn't get hockey sticks. You should have these sigmoidal curves and these companies turning over and stopping growing. That's not the image that I showed at the beginning, and it's not the image we have. This is the image we have, and there it is. This is actual data for Walmart, and it does look like a hockey stick. But you notice I've cheated a little. I stopped it at 1994 or 5, 94, I think it stopped. Here's the latest data. And what you see is even old Walmart is turning over. This line is inspired by the theory. This is, comes out of the growth theory that I mentioned based on networks. So that if I'd been a smart guy in 1990, I would have said, Walmart will be whatever it is in 2009. Didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but there it is. And uh, so there it's turning over. But we saw also that organisms like us turn over like this. And, and I'm going to talk a teeny bit about this. This is the signal of stability, which is good, but also what's very good it is the foreshadowing of death. So this is the beginning of death for Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to show you this spaghetti graph. This is 23,000 companies in the United States. And what everybody looks at, of course, is this stuff. Oh, zooming, we're all making money. But look, everybody eventually goes flat and everybody eventually dies, as I will show you in a minute. So just to give you a better, I just sorted out the top companies. You can see they're listed there. And this one, I think, is Walmart. But you can see, you see the bending over. And they all end up pretty much in the same place and ultimately in the grave. <coughs> now, I want to talk about us briefly, if I can take a few minutes. We die. And I just showed you this. I thought this was fun. This is uh, all your various, uh, you probably can't read this. Let me go over here. This is a graph of all your various functions, or some of your functions. So there's uh, maximum breathing capacity, vital capacity, renal plasma, all these marvelous things that keep you alive and the doctors measure. And this is a plot of the percentage of how well you're doing as you get older. And what you see is you improve as you grow, and then you gradually fade away systematically. Everything gets worse. Here it only goes up to 80. And of course, you die. Now, um, and you see it all goes in a very systematic way. And the question is that this is not the topic of this talk this is a whole separate talk, is why is it that we live only 100 years? Why not 1,000 years or even a few months? Where in the hell does that number come from? Why couldn't it have been 1,000 years? And where does that come from as a scientist, from all the molecular stuff, all those genes and so on, and the respiratory complex I mentioned producing ATP? Well, I'm just going to say some words now as to um, uh, about uh, dying. Uh, by why you're all going to be dead soon. And uh, here's why. Because it's kind of poetic. The very system that's keeping you alive, the systems, those networks, are what we call dissipative, which in simple English means that they have friction in them. You know, they wear. Not surprising. You know you wear out, and indeed, that's true. Those systems, by having flows, whether they're macroscopic flows, like in your respiratory system, or molecular flows inside your mitochondria, inside your cells. These have some analog of friction, and they can be literally friction by molecules colliding with each other um, and uh, causing damage, but also chemical friction, which uh, you've heard of, which is the production of something called oxygen radicals, which damage. So all this damage takes place necessarily as a byproduct of metabolism and the metabolic networks and the networks that distribute energy. So um, natural selection, of course, as 
built into us repair mechanisms, and you do repair, but it becomes incredibly costly to repair faithfully. You know, you know that with your car, um, it doesn't matter actually how many times you take it into, if you drive it system, in a systematic way, and you take it in and you get it serviced, eventually it's going to wear out, and you're quite similar. You could, of course, spend an enormous amount of money and every week have the engine rebuilt and everything done and so on. But this, then, of course, all your resources would go to that. And natural selection has, of course, allocated energy so that we repair ourselves enough so that in our, quote, natural state, when we were biological and just using 100, 200 watts to stay alive, we would live to about 40 and have 15 to 20 children in that period, of which maybe half would die, and that's what happened. And then we socialized, and uh, we've been able to extend lifespan, mostly because we have uh, uh, introduced hygiene, uh, um, sewers, and washing ourselves has been the major reason for increased lifespan, but then, of course, all of the wonderful medicine and so forth. So that lifespan has increased, but nevertheless, there is a limit to that, at least I believe very strongly, there's a limit to that because eventually you wear the system and you can do some calculations, which I don't have time to talk about, obviously. And indeed, you can see, roughly speaking, where this 100 years comes from. And why, most importantly, how in the hell can it be that if you, this piece of tissue here, instead of being part of my hand, had been a mouse, which it could well have been, it's the same stuff, it would be dead in two or three years, rather than having been part of me for 70 years. So this is... This, this is explained, in fact, by the scaling of these networks. So um, what happens is that, of course, you gradually degrade the system, and life is full of fluctuations. And eventually, even if you survive all of the diseases and the cancer and so on, eventually a fluctuation comes along that kills you after about 100. No one's lived more than 123, ever. So, um, what about companies? Let's take this over to companies. So here's something interesting. That I said we have this uh, funny old business that all of their things decrease on a per capita basis. That was the analog to economy of scale. But most importantly, profits, and remarkably, profits decrease systematically per capita, meaning per number of employees or per sale. And this is the most important point. Sales continue linearly. Profits, I'm afraid, go sublinearly. So per capita, they're decreasing, whereas sales remain constant. And this means that eventually it cannot be sustained because it's just like you. Even though the profits may be increasing, they're increasing slower than sales, and a fluctuation comes, and the company can't handle it, and it collapses. So that's been a typical thing, and what the theory, this, this framework tells you, since it's sublinear, what it tells you is that what I put there, the triumph of economies of scale over innovation. Innovation is associated with this superlinear scaling. That's what cities are. Cities are innovative. They open up opportunities as they grow. They get more diverse. They get more interesting. Cities tolerate crazy people. We just walked down Market Street today. There are so many Michigander people there. You can go nuts. But none of those people, none of those people are tolerated in a company. Companies do not tolerate crazy people. This is part of their problem. It's only when they ask <laughs> Stuart and Kevin to advise them that they allow a teeny bit of craziness in. <laughs> so, so when there are less than about 50 to 100 employees, you see a lot of fluctuations, and that's because innovation, when a company is formed, they uh, pay a lot of attention to ideas and so on. And they're not so worried about structure and the organization and who's paying the bills quite. 
But eventually, of course, you have to have that. This is a necessity of a company to have a very good administration. And eventually, and I make a cartoon of this, a company basically becomes its bureaucracy and administration and its innovative parts get squeezed out and that's what the data is telling you and these companies die. That's what I've said. Now, let's see if this... I had some trouble with this earlier. Wait, it should come up. There's a... I don't know why... There it is. Beautiful. This is hot off the press. <laughs> hot off the press. So, look at the top right. It says, probability of mortality. Notice, it goes to 100% after about 20 to 30 years. Everybody dies. Everybody, this is companies. And some are by, let's see, I have to look here because I can't read it there. Some go bankrupt and liquidate, and some just, of course, are acquired and merge, but it's the same phenomenon. And what you see is that, put slightly differently, this is survivability, and you see very few people survive beyond 50 to 60 years. And you can think of companies that are 100 years old, 200 years old, but very few that are 300. There's only one company that's older than 500 years old, and that's the Vatican. And that's for very special reasons. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to finish off to remind you of this. What I said earlier, that each one of you there is using approximately 100 watts. It's more like, it is true, it's more like 80, 80 to 90 watts. That's your 2,000 food calories a day. But your social metabolic rate is 11,000 watts. And, uh, you know, you're this great big King Kong. And uh, this is the problem. Everybody wants to be like this. And uh, it's, uh, that's the challenge. Okay, so I've brought up a lot of questions, many of which I did not answer. Um, I hinted at answers. But I wanted to give you kind of this big picture view of, first of all, a kind of unified view of the biology, cities, and companies. But most importantly, to stress the extraordinary phenomenon that we've created in terms of cities with all its open-endedness and its ability to really stimulate wealth and ideas. And uh, as a side topic, to show you that companies are really much more like us, and they are, of course, um, participate in cities as we do, and the cities really form the background environment that allows all this to happen. And then one of the things that I showed that is the big question is that to sustain this, we have to innovate faster and faster, and life inevitably gets faster and faster. Okay, I will finish there, and thank you. We're going to go over here and sit. Okay. Have a seat. Oh, I can see you. It's terrible. People, people all this time. Um, you had me up to the crazy people. Sorry? You had me all the way up to the crazy people. I, I, I suspect that that did not come out of your data. Because uh, you're saying that uh, companies are sublinear and cities are superlinear. Um, what else have you got I, I on the mechanisms no, no, of that? Obviously, um, it doesn't, no, we don't know. Um, we've, this work, the work on companies is very much work in progress. Mm -hmm. As I said, that graph of just the mortality um, we produced just uh, a couple of weeks ago, so it's, uh, um, you know, we haven't digested all of this. But, um, and certainly none of it is published, so I think you have to take it still with um, some caution. Um, but, uh, what I mean by that, I was putting, of course, in, in a uh, provocative uh, framework. What I mean is that, just to repeat what I said, cities, um, as you saw, just, I mean, just graphically, are continuously open, open and growing, and they don't die. Mm -hmm. They don't die. And part of that is that they're continually bubbling up. I mean, they're reinventing themselves. They're bringing people in. Um, uh, immigration to cities is incredibly important and new ideas are generated. Uh, and, and we believe that it is that uh, continuous flow 
um, at an informational level and the opening up of opportunity that is the lifeblood of a city. And we contrast that, and, and indeed gives rise to the superlinear behavior, behavior, et cetera. It's all kind of one package. This is in contrast to um, uh, organisms and indeed cities. And if we think of organisms, uh, we grow and we stop, but we as individuals do not evolve in our lifespan. Yeah. Whereas the species evolves, of mm -hmm. course, um, over periods that are much longer than an individual's lifespan. Mm -hmm. A city evolves on a kind of continuous basis. And the That's implication is nice. that companies, after an initial kind of innovative evolutionary period, if you want to call it that, be very quickly tend to become ossified. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for them to uh, break out of a mold. You know, there are companies, there are certainly exceptions to that. I mean, there are companies that have done this. The rule that have I've reinvented heard is, themselves yeah, in some way. The rule I've heard is uh, countries, uh, companies are grown by the engineers and then they're turned over to the accountants and then to the lawyers and then they die. Yes, that's roughly it. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. A couple people, Sam Penrose and Kevin Kelly, both asked, what about nations, what about countries? Yeah, we've not done a lot on countries, and uh, we've done some, a little bit. They seem and to be more like cities in terms yes, of their longevity. Yes, they're much more like cities. But the reason we haven't is that um, countries, cities are kind of organic. They really did, you know, they, they grew um, much like an organism did, even though they're not organisms. But countries are much more political. I mean, they have these um, um, unnatural boundaries in many cases, um, and they're much less organic. And so um, we're, we've looked at some of that data and it scales and so on, but we've, t we've not paid a lot of attention yet. We will, and, other pe and incidentally, other people have looked at countries uh, stimulated by this. Mm -hmm. So I can't answer, I'm sorry, I can't miss Kevin. If it was Kevin's, I haven't, uh, um, I'm afraid we, we don't have, we, have, we just haven't gone there yet. Do you want to after? Yes, we do. And in fact, uh, when I go back to Santa Fe week after next, um, we have collaborators um, uh, from Harvard, from the Kennedy School at Harvard, who, are, who think in terms of countries. Mm -hmm. Because they're interested, they're from the, the, uh, the Kennedy School and are thinking much more in terms of development at the, at the nation level and trade trade is very important in mm -hmm. terms of what they're thinking about. And uh, we want, we're trying to bring these two things together. So this is... Well, I can imagine the economists will, you know, the trillions of dollars of, uh, of you know, financial flow uh, as a network sure. out of hand sure. in some ways. We'll sure. see. Um, here's an interesting question from John Christensen. Can you predict the amount of nature, parks, open space, plants, and animals in a city? And uh, you know, well, Los Angeles <laughs> famously has approximately no parks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a very this is a very interesting question, very important question, because it, it, it the way <coughs> we have attacked. So one of the things that we've struggled with, um, and you struggled with from the beginning, of course, is what is a city? You know, what what defines the city? And, and I touched on it. Um, metropolitan uh, area. This metropolitan area. And very roughly speaking, this means kind of within commuting distance, you know, so that because it, you want to have some, some uh, uh, area where everybody is connected somehow with someone else. Uh -huh. So that kind of defines it. Now, then you ask, okay, what about defining the city as an area? You know, what's the area of the city? Uh -huh. And this brings <coughs> in exactly this question. Density and the stuff like that. Yes, mm -hmm. the question of density and then the question of open space. Do you include that? Do you not include it? And so mm -hmm. on. And uh, I must say the preliminary data that we've looked at shows very little um, systematic behavior of uh, open space in a city. You know, there mm -hmm. isn't a systematic scaling. And that does seem to represent much more the individuality, history, and geography of a city than all these other socioeconomic metrics. And so, like, number of parks and stuff like that doesn't map may against not, the creatives not, and all that. May but. not, no, exactly. So well, why do we have the damn things? Well, that's a good question. We have them <laughs> because people, you know, I think that that came presumably 
from, uh, you know, after all, in the beginning, cities were populated by migration of people from small towns and agrarian communities. They had quite enough and, of open space they wanted and to cluster. Down now, and then there was no doubt <laughs> some pressure to have some natural open space. Oh, I see, yeah. A tree, I remember trees, you would say yeah, stuff like right. that. Paul Liao has a question, can you make any predictions regarding the levels of people's happiness in the size of the <laughs> cities where they live? Well, yeah, so that's an interesting question again. Um, uh, there are people that um, have hap you know, measured, ha invented happiness indices, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we do not have, unfortunately, there is not enough data um, that has done it for cities. They tend to do it for companies. There mm -hmm. is some on cities, but mm -hmm. it's not enough to really deduce anything. There are on companies, on, on, on um, sorry, on uh, countries, and um, uh, you know, since we haven't dealt with countries, we don't know if there's any systematic behavior. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think, isn't it, Bhutan is the happiest country, and uh, they have it in the constitution. I think you're, you're required yeah, to, be has to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> But of course, you know, I mean, one of the things that comes out of that is happiness is not connected with wealth indices and so on. Does your theory explain Detroit? As a question from Philip, who puts it in the terms, does Detroit meet the predictability of once exciting, always exciting? Say that again. Detroit. Uh, oh, once exciting, now ah. not so exciting. Well, Detroit well it's exciting in a different way. Yes. Can you find a job? That's well, Detroit is very, and brings up another piece of work that we're moving into. So all the data that was shown here was averaging over this metropolitan area. Ah. Right. So we do not deep, we have not yet, but this is what we want to do if we mm. can get the data is deconstruct a city. So mm -hmm. Manhattan, you know, looking at Manhattan as a subunit versus the Bronx as a subunit, because our data for New York is the total metropolitan area, including the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Going now to Detroit, so what you find in Detroit is that, um, of course, the central part has become necrotic. It's uh, dying. It no doubt will be resurrected in some form. But if you look at the mm. integrated Detroit, the metropolitan area of Detroit, despite the extraordinary failure of the core and the loss of, uh, or at least the, the serious decrease in the automobile industry, Detroit has done a remarkable job in the suburbs of creating kind of a high-tech industry. Mm -hmm. And if you average over Detroit, Detroit isn't doing so badly, actually. Isn't doing uh, badly. What has happened is that there has been a migration um, out of the core and an attraction of immigration into the um, uh, outer rings. Mm -hmm. and, the, and Ann Arbor as a university has played a very important role in that. Aha. Uh -huh. So, if you include so Ann this Arbor, is something we want to do. Applies, is, and yeah. It's very important, of course. And now, to, if you want, in, in terms of applying this uh, to uh, planning, to uh, design, to um, you know, uh, political questions, it's very important in this work, ultimately, for us to start thinking about the deconstruction of cities, because we now have, we believe, the general rules mm -hmm. for a total, an integrated area. But now let's deconstruct. Let's, let's look at its heart and liver and lungs and so on. So you made the point going in is the cities are super linear because they are social networks. <laughs> and you've probably That's noticed. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. And cities were basically a thing that humans invented so we could uh, ex expand and accelerate our social networking. Well, you may have noticed that that's happening online now. Yes. In a way that has nothing to do with city limits. It just has to do with access to Absolutely. the internet, which is damn near global and about yep. to get there. Does that change the yeah. whole picture? So that's, a very, that's also a very interesting, qu interesting question, which we've thought about quite a bit. Um, and that is the question that, uh, first of all, going back to what I said, that you, the, these major innovations are critical for driving growth and continuing an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. And the latest one has been the internet. Mm -hmm. And the is internet, the internet a city? So I'll come to that too in a second. All right. Uh, well, at least talk about it. I don't it's know if I can zip code it. and everything. Be so um, the uh, area code. 
So the question is, first of all, um, the internet provides a different form of communication. And it, the question is, from this viewpoint, does it actually change the social network and the dynamics of that social network mm -hmm. in a way that's going to affect cities? That's the first question. And I've gone both ways on that. When I first started thinking about it, I thought, my God, yes, because it's, of course, the speed of communication is much faster and the access is much greater. Now, mm -hmm. of course, the counter to that is things And it like went up in a scaling way with the quantity of people online. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it does. And there's this Metcalf's law that the right. value of a net goes up as the square yeah. of the number of nodes. But, um, you know, we've had other networks been introduced, like the telephone, which had a huge impact, but didn't change anything in terms of this. That is, human communication happened, in, you know, relative to what was before the telephone, happened instantaneously, and it quickly spread throughout the whole city and, the, and, and across the whole urban system. And it has not affected, as far as we can tell, uh, any of these, these phenomena. Um, but uh, let, let me bring in a point that we came across the Global Business Network years ago, which is that basically corporations, the international corporations, came to pass because of the telephone and the jet plane. Yeah. And what that allowed you to do was to connect cities into what amounts to a kind of a world city in which these yes. multinational corporations live and die. Yep. Um, is this is kind of an ur yep. urban phenomenon? Yes. Yeah, so this is a very, it's also a very interesting question. So mm -hmm. I have a incipient collaboration, let's call it that actually, a collaboration with researchers in Singapore. I was recently in Singapore, and Singapore mm -hmm. is a very interesting example. Mm -hmm. Everybody's familiar with it. It's a city-state, but it's a city-state like no other has ever been, mm -hmm. because it has no hinterland. The hinterland, you know, if it were an organic city, parts of Indonesia and Malaysia would be connected with Singapore, but it's completely disconnected, really, because its real connection Mm -hmm. is to, you know, Hong Kong and New York and London and Rio and so on. And so, um, one, of the, so one of the questions, first questions is, does, is Singapore part of these systems in some way? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we now have this project going, trying mm -hmm. to compare, ask first of all the question, if Singapore had been an American city, how, does it, how do its metrics stack up? You know, does it have... Hmm. Okay. You know, in terms of its roads, its mm. infrastructure, in terms of the number of AIDS cases, number of, et cetera, et cetera, number of patents it produces and so on. Is it comparable to an American city? But more importantly is, is the system that is now evolving an urban system, namely New York, London, Singapore, Hong Kong, and so on, are they now some global networked urban system. And so we're just starting to look at that data, and I, at the moment, obviously don't know the answer. But you brought up, and I do want to answer a little bit, at least mm -hmm. tell you a little bit, about um, uh, net cities on the internet. Okay. Are they cities? Now, there are people that have looked at this. We started to look at this, and in fact, I meant to contact, you just reminded me, uh, Philip Rosedale, who invented Second Life. Mm -hmm. And Philip Rosedale, very kindly, does everybody know what Second Life is? Roughly, yeah, everyone knows what Second Life is. So, uh, and he spoke on this very stage. I'm a couple sure, of years yeah, ago. he's a very smart guy, and he's very imaginative and good speaker. He, so he was very kind to offer us uh, the data for the evolution of Second Life, right. and could we look at this? Could we somehow plot its trajectory and ask the same kinds of questions we've asked? about it as a city, but in particular, does it deviate in some way, or are the various clusters that are forming on Second Life, do they scale like American cities, global cities, or is there something new evolving on the internet? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you always uh, say at these gatherings, I've been to a couple, uh, well, Google is doomed. Um, <laughs> That's because you asked me to be provocative. 
And you know, the, uh, somebody asked about uh, does Congress. Larry Page will not talk to me again. I mean. Oh, he will. Um, Suzanne asked, uh, have you shared your, with the U.S. Congress your theories about companies dying versus, quote, too big to fail? Have I shared with whom? With, the, with the U.S. Congress. Uh, no, that, I, you know, it's too big to, to fail no. in a, an abomination no. in your world? Probably is. Well, it is in, a, in the sense that, um, you know, the, the, the speculation is, uh, what I said earlier, that um, since companies seem to be very much more like organisms, and it's and in organisms for, you know, if you believe in Darwinian evolution, it's very important that organisms die so that, you know, new ideas, new phenomena can evolve. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's crucial for the economy. I think that's absolutely crucial for the economy that companies die. And so, uh, but of course there is, you know, to mitigate that, as in the case of too big to fail, you know, I suppose there can be consequences for mm -hmm. the overall economy that uh, someone, some politician judges to be uh, disastrous for the economy. But may I say, I will say a, um, a very provocative statement. One of the problems being a scientist working in this is the frustration that the people making the decisions um, don't rarely talk to scientists, very, to very rarely talk to uh, social scientists. They do talk to economists, <laughs> which may be the problem. Yeah, what about that? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it's a problem. So one of the things I have discovered, incidentally, in my talking with politicians and policymakers and hmm. so on, is that uh, most people uh, don't understand what an exponential is. When you say something's expanding exponentially, you don't understand what it is. And if, if you give me a minute, I'll present a little cartoon of that. Can I take a second? And Do it. Okay. Exponential. So here it is. Um, so imagine that I want to make a test tube of penicillin. And I know that if I start at 8 o'clock in the morning with a couple of penicillin bacteria, I'll fill up the tube. Okay, at noon. Mm -hmm. At noon. Okay. So you put these this bacterium in the test tube, and it doubles every second. Every second it's doubling. And I've calculated that by noon it will be full. Question, when is it half full? What time between eight and noon is the tube half full? Second before. So it's only half full a second before. Now think of the following. Think of five seconds before. Five seconds before is 2 to the fifth, which is 32. So it's 3% full. So five seconds before, here's this test tube, and it's just this teeny weeny bit. So those bacteria in there are saying, it's great, doubling, growing, everything's fantastic. Looks like it's infinity to go, you know. They don't realize that five seconds later, it's all over. <laughs> that's exponential growth, and that's the problem. So, Robin Sloan asked, I, <laughs> the news is best just before the news gets catastrophic. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so I have two questions. One from Robin Sloan. Uh, she asked, how do we design companies less like mammals and more like cities, please? Uh -huh. Well, I think that's a huge question because uh, I, don't, I don't know, obviously don't know the answer. I can suggest some things and I'm not sure they're doable. But, you know, just at a very simplistic level, what this suggests is that, um, you know, when... So what happens with a company, a big company? It, 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 it's quite innovative at the beginning and often as it grows in many industries, it has, a, it used to have research and development mm -hmm. and so on. But typically what happens is that as the, when times get a bit tough, economies of scale get even more powerful. And you say, well, don't need all that research and development. We'll cut that back because that's costing us a lot of money. It's long term. It's not short term. We can reconstitute it in two or three years when the company's in better shape. Some companies like IBM, which is doing well on longevity, have a rule that they don't cut their R&D. Exactly. So IBM is a fantastic case in that regard. Mm -hmm. Ford, General Motors, 
Bell Labs, mm -hmm. who had phenomenal R&D, cut them and have run into deep trouble. And mm -hmm. that's typical. So that's just a, um, you know, a kind of narrative of the problem that, uh, that it's the, the easiest thing to cut is something that looks strategic and long term. And so but the, the, and where the, the way the companies do it now is they buy the R&D. They buy small exactly. companies. Exactly. So the new Are you saying you, that doesn't work? So the question is, so mm -hmm. one of the things that has happened is exactly what you said, is the companies no longer grow them inside, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But when they see something they think is important, they buy it mm -hmm. and try to somehow integrate it. I think the jury is out very mm -hmm. strongly on that one as to whether that model can work. Um, I'm very dubious mm -hmm. because uh, the, the, you know, what I know, which is not very much about some of those big companies, but um, it, what happens is there is a very dominant culture in the host company that is very hard to integrate with the more innovative, buzzing little company that is trying to feed something in. And um, you so know, they one should of the great things they should try not to integrate these things. No, well, they should, but it's very difficult. Whereas a city has things like this going on, mm -hmm. all kinds of things that are bubbling up and a lot of, and a lot of interaction, very hard to do in a company. And Google, bless their hearts, of mm -hmm. course, was founded trying to do that. Mm -hmm. and that's one of its great mm -hmm. you know, uh, characteristics, mm -hmm. and it's trying very hard. And I, you know, my own interpretation of. Larry Page becoming the, the, the CEO again is in fact a recognition that they need, mm -hmm. you know, more buzz, more city-like, so to speak. And in fact, as you when you go to Google, as you well know, much better than I, there is that attempt in mm -hmm. the structure of the company. Um, and I, you know, whether that is the panacea that solves these kinds of things, I I don't know. But it's, but definitely from this data. It looks as if that it's, even though it may be very difficult in terms of in economic hard times, supporting more speculation and more innovation and more transparency and uh, collaboration in a company is critical for its very long-term future. Here, here. Well, I think you know, what you've done is define the nature of the problem very nicely for these organizations. Let me go to a slightly more cosmic level. Um, you've been very upbeat tonight. Um, well, other times I've heard you yes. emphasize that uh, you know these cities yes. accelerate their growth. Uh, there's a kind of a singularity looming, and we keep avoiding it by a sort of a different dimension of innovation, and then a different dimension. Of, but the time on those gets shorter and shorter, and still we're still going to singularity, verticality, craziness. And physicists really hate singularities, except in other people's black holes. Yes, <laughs> Fine. And then you usually say, so uh, this can't go on forever. Right. There has to be collapse in the picture here somewhere. And that sounds very dire. And it sounds like you're, you're saying that cities need to learn how to be sigmoidal in some fashion, or they perish. Now, in history, what are your examples of cities that have accelerated themselves to death? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. We think that uh, some city like Rome has done some of that. We don't know because it's been very hard to get data. We, we, need, we need data mm -hmm. to really, you know, you, it's extremely difficult to get credible data for either ancient cities or even cities, you know. We do have some, in fact, I didn't talk about it, but we've looked at New York mm -hmm. uh, from 1770, I think, mm -hmm. to recently. And uh, New York has been through periods where it has gone stagnated and started mm -hmm. to collapse. Mm -hmm. And you can see if I take too long to dig it up. But you can see them. So you see these, these things happening in New York, but you also see periods where it's on, on the verge of collapse. So the question is, so first of all, I want to amend what you said. You said cities, but in fact, that graph applies potentially to the whole economy, actually. That, that the whole economy has that kind of characteristic. And you could even think of, all, of the sum of all cities being the economy, but this, you could apply this same kind of thing to a total economy. 
And uh, you, you know, in, in our so what are your examples of economies that have accelerated till they collapsed? Well, we don't know. We don't know ones that have. have uh, but you predict they will. Well, this <laughs> will. I mean, the point is that that all of the evidence, and I didn't show. There were two graphs I didn't show at the end. Um, show that first of all, this acceleration, this continuous acceleration, um, and in fact, uh, the graph I didn't show is a graph, many of you have probably, have, maybe he's talked in this series, Ray Kurzweil. Mm, he and, did. Uh, yeah. So Kurzweil, um, even though I com quite completely disagree with his interpretation, uh, of it, but I do agree with his, the data he's collected, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he draws a line uh, of the, the, that goes through all the major innovations. And uh, interestingly enough, the line that he drew, just connecting them, is predicted by this theoretical framework, which is... So what's your disagreement so, with Kurzweil? So my, oh, my disagreement is that he sees, um, you know, the singularity building to where we will become cyborgs, right? That, you know, there's the next thing that these... There's something wonderful. Something yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. I see it the opposite, that if you take it to its ultimate conclusion, that uh, the system is not sustainable, and the metaphor, which I said near the end of the talk, I didn't quite complete the last piece. I left it out. I said, you know, we are on a, an accelerating treadmill. So we're on mm -hmm. a treadmill, but we have to, faster and faster, we have to change treadmills, mm -hmm. right? Which are going faster and faster. And- This the, is gonna make a great YouTube the video. Past, <laughs> the, part, the piece that we can't, the, the big question is, can you continue to do that without having a heart attack, the whole system having collapsing. Because if you take it to its logical conclusion, you know, so what does that say? That says that the time, socioeconomic time, is not this time. It's not this linear time of the watch and the clock and the sun, the earth going around the sun. The time is governed by the dynamics of these networks which tells you that the clock is going actually faster and faster and faster. So something that took 1,000 years to do 10,000 years ago only takes 20 years now. And that time frame is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter if you took it to its logical conclusion. That is, if the same dynamic continues at work. So the question is, can we change that dynamic? Because that dynamic is over the edge of the cliff. And uh, you, the only way of solving that is there's dramatic solutions, which are, of course, going to the stable configuration of all of us becoming hunter-gatherers, which none of us want. Uh, the alternative is... I tried it once. It sucks. Yeah, it does sound good. <laughs> exactly. So we don't want that, although that may be the stable configuration of human beings, but mm -hmm. we don't want that. Obviously, we want all of this. Mm -hmm. And to get all of that and have this, um, we need to somehow change the growth metaphor in such a way that maybe what we can do is have a tolerate periods of stagnation, mm. even collapse, <coughs> followed by these, these kind of super and linear... And oscillate. Yes, yeah, so much of, more. Mm. That's, and, and that means that we have to adapt. We have to adapt society to change, to, to change that is both up and down. It's not the image that everything's getting better. Mm -hmm. I think has to be thrown out. That one is not sustainable, that everything getting better and bigger. Oh, and it is very much, one second, and it's very much the image is of those idiotic bacteria thinking that they have, you know, what looks like an infinite time and it's five seconds left. Because our growth trajectory, mm -hmm. all of the phenomena that we talk about is growing exponentially. How old are you? 70. There you are. Soon to die. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> if you were a 24-year-old physicist hearing this, wouldn't it sound kind of exciting and not so, so uh, yeah, self-extinguishing? Yes. Yeah. No, it might. No, it might. I'll tell you, my, my, my concern is the following, <coughs> actually. I actually think that uh, ultimately, you know, this, as I keep emphasizing, this is very much work in progress. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I didn't do it, but I... Could, should have sort of taken off my uh, shirt and my vest and so on, and really let my hair down and 
That's what I'm doing here, is exposing things that have not been published and speculated. <coughs> so, I believe that one could find a way of, of stabilizing the system. Okay. But, but, the trouble is that we've left, my concern is less that than we've left it too late. Uh -huh. That is, we should have started, like you did, 50 years ago, well, maybe not 50, 40 years ago, I did what thinking oh. about right, right. these kinds of questions. Mm. These people have been thinking about long term. You know, right. you know long, that's what long, and I'm thinking, and ah. we have not. I mean, we as a society have not. We've blindly gone ahead. So, for example, I hope everybody realizes this. When, you know, when, when they say, when President Obama says growth rate in the last quarter was only one and three quarters percent or two percent, and then the Republicans clobber him because it's not fast enough, and he's looking for four or five percent. You do realize that two percent still means it's exponential. <laughs> it's still exponential. It's just a slower exponential, but it's still exponential. We're still like those bacteria. That is the paradigm. Okay. And so, if it's so that's the pro so the question is. My concern is we have that in our heads, and we're not going to sustain it. And the thing that's going to be the problem is social unrest. Social unrest when we start getting into approaching collapsed situations. Berserkers blowing up things and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, people getting, I mean, already. I mean, it's amazing that we don't have people in the streets already, frankly. Well, you know, that, that's your that's data point. So you're saying if we think long term, we'll somehow um, manage this. Potentially. It could curve be. from a, a deadly self-acceleration to a dynamic Something, sustainability. Yes. But nothing you've described yet has been volitional. It's been... Volitional. Yes. Everything's just expected. happened because it's, it's happened. built in the system. No, exactly. It's kind of extraordinary. That so the system, will it level off? But it's an emergent behavior mm -hmm. of this. Do, in fact, this is part of it, right? This is part of the networking. And this, all of this going on in this marvelous bubbling way has somehow led to this kind of systematic behavior. None of the things of up the till now about cities. So, that's the, so yeah. the question now is, can we actually take control of that? Ooh. <laughs> and the, the question that raises... And people thought I was weird about geoengineering and taking control of yeah. climate. You want to take control of civilization. Well, that's the question. Is that... Come awake. <laughs> come awake. Someone says. Come awake. Oh, well, that one. No, you could argue. I mean, no, one of the, let me be super provocative with that. You know, if we look at the United States. Where, maybe? If you look at the United States, you know, we, we have this extraordinary constitution and an extraordinary democracy that has served us well. But it was designed for an agrarian society. <laughs> it was designed when only 3% of us were doing all these things. 97% uh, of us were living in tiny hamlets and on, the, on farms. And that's the system we invented for Okay, that. so Singapore is the future. Singapore the is question. the world city. So the question is, is Singapore 21st century city? And that's what, or 20, and 21st century politics. Because one of the things that's happened, uh, you know, and it's, it's very interesting. I don't know, I totally speculate. Autocracy. We're, we're, we're dysfunctional. Mm -hmm with a pseudo-democracy mm -hmm. that doesn't, you know, that can't work at the mm. moment, and it's hard to it's see cool. how we get out of this. So we all become Singapore. That ain't so bad. Well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm happy. I like our system, frankly. I like it. But well, it ain't working. You're, you're going to go immerse yourself in Singapore, so we expect you to report back on if that's the future. Good. Thank you. This is great. <laughs>